Despite the fact I didn't kill anybody, I didn't do anything illegal, I didn't even say anything I hadn't said before, that speech caused me to lose my business, my reputation and my fortune. My grandfather, my father, a couple of uncles, and there was about six shops, something like that. It expanded um, quite well in the 50s, <laughs> a long time ago. I was working in there, just behind the counter. And that was good, you know, it was good to, to really start at the bottom. Jewel pricing, everything, everybody does that today, but there were very few people doing this. Everything was uh, on sale. Um, we took out the diamond rings out the front window and we put in the earrings and the chains. We put loads of posters up. I had a lot of opposition from managers and my father, to say the least, and people saying that, you know, you're ruining the business. But it had instant results. And then when we changed the merchandise there, we were selling a thousand earrings an hour. It, was, it really then took off and the profits went from like two or three million to 60 million in a very short space of time, which made our share price the fastest growing share price on the whole stock market. If you know your particular field, then you will always have an advantage over somebody else who's going into your field. We also do this uh, nice sherry decanter. It's cut glass and it's really only cost four pounds 95 pence. People say to me, how can you sell this for such a low price? I say, because it's total crap. Um, I was asked by the Institute of Directors to speak at their conference at the Albert Hall. It was always the most successful businessman around at that time was asked um, to, to speak at the Institute of Directors. I was quite, you know, nervous about being asked to do a speech in front of 6,000 people at the Albert Hall. I hadn't done anything like that before. But I sent the uh, draft of the speech to my uh, co-directors. Nobody really came back to me on it, except for one of the directors who came into my office and he said, I've read your speech for the Albert Hall. Uh, it's a great speech, but um, the only thing is missing is a joke. So I said, well, the joke that always goes down well, we sell a sherry decanter for £4.95. I got the price wrong, it's actually, it was twelve ninety five, I think. Now, people in the, in the retail industry always justify, why, how can we sell it? They always ask, how can you sell it at such a low price? Well, they'll say, because we buy it in bulk, or we cut out the middleman, or some sort of rubbish like that. So the joke was, well, we can sell it at such a low price, because it's crap. Um, which were meant to be just about that one product, not anything like that any reference to the jewellery or anything. Um, and it was a product I inherited from H. Samuel when I bought it and I was never keen on it anyway. The Daily Mirror was there and they collared me on the outside and said, aren't you making fun of your customers? I said, no, it was just making fun of myself more than anything. Anyway, the next day it was headlines of the Daily Mirror and then the Sun changed their headline from something about the poll tax to this and the rest is history. And here we are talking about 26 years later. I mean, it had a horrendous effect on the business. Sales collapsed overnight. They said I said it in private uh, behind my customers back, which how could I say it in private behind my customers back at the Albert Hall? Uh, and it was televised. One minute I was right, flying high and uh, very happy and because it was a struggle to take the Ratners group to where it was. As I said, you know, there was a loss-making family business. We achieved a hell of a lot. We almost had a monopoly in this country and nobody can compete with us. And we'd just announced a £125 million profit whenever all the other retailers were were struggling, going backwards. But, you know, we were defined that everything was going well. And I thought, how the hell could some stupid joke like this do so much damage? And suddenly, we were the butt of all the jokes. Well, I didn't bounce back. Um, I came back after a long time. There was no bouncing because I really didn't do anything for seven years, I think it was. You know, I opened a health club um, and sold that for four million pounds, went back into jewellery, which was also online, which was very successful. I couldn't joke about it then, but to joke about the speech, cause how horrendous it was, nobody died. But I can look back on it now and say, well, I, I have turned it into to my advantage, you know, so just if you can turn that into your advantage, something the worst corporate gaffe of all time, then people can turn anything into advantage, I, I guess. Somebody once just says that shit happens, or in my case crap happens, um, and you have to readjust.
that's life. It's gonna some sort of shit is gonna happen to everybody, and um, you can't dwell on um, on that because it, if you wallow in your grief, it makes it worse. So you you adjust, and it would be ridiculous to have anybody else to talk about it. It all comes from the heart. There's nothing light-hearted really about the book. It's sort of warts and all, uh, and there's some really you know uncomfortable bits in it, uh, which really. Uh, quite emotional that has to really come from me but when it's about you particularly your autobiography then I think it really comes into its own that you get the person whose autobiography is talking about it and it really becomes much more intimate business is difficult if you accept that it's no longer difficult failure is the route to success if you like so the best advice I was ever given is don't give up.